Good evening. Good evening. And welcome to our Ash Wednesday service. It's great to see all of you. It's great to see the choir. And I hope that you're ready to begin your travel to the cross and to Easter. 40 days, Lent. We begin tonight with Ash Wednesday, and so it's good to be um, in worship together. This is an opportunity for us to grow one step in our faith. This is an opportunity for us to remind ourselves that we follow Jesus who followed a path. And so we try to imitate his life as we go through not just these 40 days, but especially in these 40 days. And so this is why we gather tonight. A couple of notes about the service. We will have the opportunity to have communion in three different ways. If you are comfortable with intinction, which is tearing a piece of bread and dipping it in the cup, we will have an intinction station right here. We will also have, right beside that station, a, um, a, what, how we normally take communion on Sunday morning, a little cup of juice and a small wafer of pie crust bread that is wonderful. And um, Ann and I joke about how good that is in some of our past churches it's not been so good, but Donna Bainter, you do a great job. <laughs> and so if you'd like to take a traditional um, form of communion, that will be right here. If you would prefer to not get up and move about the sanctuary, just stay in your seat, and we will have a deacon um, serve you right where you are. So however you would like to take communion tonight, two different options up front, the normal traditional process at your seat, all of that is okay and we are looking forward to sharing in that communion time. Of course, we will also have our imposition of ashes. So if you come forward, Patty and I will meet you here. And um, if you remain at your seat, we will come and find you. You uh, can have either a sign of the cross on your forehead or on your hand, and you can choose that. For those of you who might have bangs, if you go like that, we'll know where you would like your cross. Um, if you just stick out your hand, we'll know that too. For those of us with high foreheads, we don't have to worry about it as much. It is good to be together. It is good to begin our journey down the Lenten process. Let us prepare our hearts and our minds for Lent and for this service as we hear the prelude.
Would all those who are able please stand and join me in the call to worship? The Lenten journey begins here today. We enter the Lenten season to prepare ourselves to welcome the risen Christ with the lives renewed by the breath of his spirit. We assume a discipline of self-examination, confession, and penitence. We dedicate ourselves to meditate upon the scriptures and to converse with God in prayer. We seek to be more faithful dis disciples of Christ, whose lives are shaped by the one whom we confess to be Lord and Savior of the world. To, to this, this end, end let, let us worship, worship God. God. If you would turn in your hymnals to number 575, we will join in singing, Come and Find the Quiet Center. standing and join me in the invocation. Almighty and everlasting God, you hate nothing that you have made and forgive the sins of all those who are penitent. Create and make in us new and contrite hearts that lamenting our sins and acknowledging our humanness, we may receive from you, the God of all mercy, perfect forgiveness and peace, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Amen. And may God so abide with us as we go through this season of Lent. Our scripture that will focus our worship service tonight comes from Job, chapter 42, verses 1 through 6. It's printed in the bulletin if you'd like to read along. If you'd like to listen along, that is fine. Let us hear the word. Then Job answered the Lord, I know, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I've uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. May God, add, may God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this night. If you've looked at the front of your bulletin, you've seen something very colorful. You've seen something that is the theme of our Lenten journey for this year. Rise up. Rise up. Rise up, O oh friends. What can that mean for us? Well, it can mean many things, but we are working our way from this night to Easter, where there's one who's very important to us that has risen, right? Okay, good, you haven't fallen asleep. I saw some nodding. <laughs> At seven o'clock, we're all kind of snug and ready, and especially on a cold night, ready to be warm, right? <coughs> so we're working our way. And the hope is that each day through Lent, we will rise up a little more, that we will rise up in faith just one bit more each day, that we can have a closer relationship with God, that we can more emulate and imitate the ways of Jesus in this world. This is our hope, and this is our, our goal as we go through the process of Lent. And so we seek to work toward Easter and the resurrection of Jesus, but we seek to rise up a bit each day for ourselves. So we come into the service tonight to rise up from the ashes. There's a story of a warring general from a long time ago. He had sent his scouts forward to the next town. As he came riding in with his army, he was disappointed to find that no one was left in the town. He said to his scouts, where are all the people of this town to pay homage to me, the conquering general? And the scout said, they were afraid and they left, they ran, they hid, they're gone. Was there no one left to say, oh general, welcome, we beseech thee? save our lives. He was looking for someone to just pay him a little honor, a little tribute. And they said, well, there is one person left. It's the priest, and he's in the temple. So he hurried to the temple, and he thrust open the doors. He said, bring me the priest. But the priest couldn't be found. And so after searching, they found him silently reading in his study. The general comes, knocks on the door and says, why haven't you come to greet me? Don't you know that I could run you through without even blinking an eye? And the priest says to the general, don't you know that I can be run through without ever blinking an eye? The general thought about that for a moment, bowed low, and walked out the door, shutting it behind him. It takes courage to remain faithful. It takes courage to seek faith. It takes courage to overcome fear. The Lenten journey takes courage. Because it is in this time that we come face to face with ourselves. It is in this time, and especially this night, when we confess that we're not perfect people. No matter how much we want to project that to the world, we're not perfect. It takes courage 
that even if you can freely admit that you're not perfect, it takes courage to accept forgiveness, which is truly divine. In the story of Job, Job is one of my favorites. Has anybody ever read the story of Job from front to end? The beginning of the book to the end of the book? It's a great story. It is a great story. There is this great man named Job, and he's one of God's favorite sons. He's one of God's favorite servants. And we know that he's one of God's favorite servants because in the, in the time that this story is written, there are certain things that will show that you are one of God's favorite people. If you have a lot of land, if you have a lot of servants, if you have a lot of children, if you have a lot of farm animals, and Job is blessed with all of these good things. Job has all of these things. There's also a little council, a little divine church board that meets on occasion. And God has called as the chair of this council all of his divine beings, divine entities to come and have a board meeting. And they're all coming and taking their seat at the table, if you will. And in comes someone that we think is a really bad person. Satan. Now the Satan of this story might not be the same as the Satan of the New Testament. But the same kind of person. The one who brings evil into the world. The one who brings hardship into the world. And so God says, hey Satan, have you noticed my servant Job? And Satan says, well of course. You keep him surrounded with such good things. You keep a hold on him. You won't let me touch him. Of course he's going to believe in you. Of course he's going to be a good servant. Of course he's going to follow you. And, and, and God says, well, isn't that the way it's supposed to be? And Satan says, let me do some things. Let's test his faith. And God says, okay, just don't put a hand on him. So a day comes, Job's children happen to all be in the same place, having a fine meal together, and the house collapses on all of them. Warring armies come and take over his land and take over his farm animals. Everyone and everything that he has in his life, everything that shows that he is a good and faithful servant to God is taken away from him. But Job makes no argument and continues to follow God, doesn't complain. It's time for another one of these divine board meetings. And God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? See how right he is? See how wonderful he is? See how he stays faithful to me? And, and the Satan says, yes, but you protect him. Allow me to lay a hand on him. And we'll see if he stays faithful. And God says, okay but just don't kill him. So now, he is taken from his house and he is afflicted with boils and disease and he ends up on an ash heap <coughs> digging at his skin with clay just to find relief. And now his wife comes and says, you still believe? Denounce God and die. That would be better than what your life is right now. And he tells her she's foolish, that he will always believe in God. He has three friends, Eliphaz, Zophar, and I know this, Bildad. And they come to him. They come to him and they say, what'd you do wrong? What did you do wrong? Because the only way that you get all this stuff taken away from you, Job, you've done something wrong. Repent and everything will be made right. And he sits there on his ash heap, digging at his sores 
childless, moneyless, landless, and says, I've done nothing wrong. Now, that's a brave thing to say, because if that was the worldview, how do you hold to say, well, I've lost everything, and yet I haven't done anything wrong? I don't know. But he, he, he claims, through the whole entirety of the book, that I've done nothing wrong. His friends, good friends that they are, don't believe him. They continue for chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter to try to tell him he must have done something wrong. But he claims his innocence. That's, the, that's how the book is predicated, you understand. That he is <coughs> blameless, he's guiltless, and yet he's received harsh punishment. It gets to the end of the book, and that's where our reading tonight came from. Gets to the end of the book, and Job has decided that it's time to sue God. It's time to take God to court. And so, Job has this court case against God, and God comes out firing. God comes out aggressive and says, Job, were you there at creation? Are you as, as much a creator as I am? Could you do that, Job? Can you um, create all the animals? Can you create all the food? Can you create all the plants? Were you there? Are you as powerful as I am? You, you Job, call me to court? Can you know when new animals are born or when new babies are born to people? Are you that in touch with the universe that you can do that? Were you there when I overcame the waters of chaos, the creatures, behemoth, and leviathan. Can you control those, Job? And what we read tonight is Job's response. You know what, God, you're right. You're more powerful than I am. I wasn't there when all of these things happened, and because I've said these things to you and I brought you to court, I'm embarrassed. I'm mortified with myself. Let me just go back to my ash heap and repent. I had only known you by what I had heard, but now I have seen you and I know how inadequate I am in front of you. There's a lot about this story that I don't like. I don't necessarily like this idea that the more you have, the more faithful you are. I don't necessarily like the idea that God will toy with us as human beings. But this idea of being able to rise up from the ash heap of life. You see, the very next part of the story is that in this conversation, by being faithful, by, me, by remaining true to his faith, Job is restored. And not just a little bit, and not just restored to where he was, but restored to even more. More children, more land, more farm animals. I guess God felt a little guilty. But the idea, my friends, as we come here on this Ash Wednesday night, that we can be on our own ash heaps, that we can be not happy with ourselves, that we can feel a little less than faithful, but we can rise up, well, I think that's powerful. That we can be honest with God, and God will say, servant, Know that you are forgiven. Have you ever heard of the bird, the mythical bird, the phoenix? I'm not big into mythology, but the idea of this beautiful bird that everyone wanted a piece of, that everyone thought there was healing in this bird, there's only one at any given time. This bird was tired of trying to deal with all the people and all the animals who wanted the healing and who wanted to just see the beauty of this bird in connection with the sun, decides to move away from this place, goes to a far away place and lives 
for a very long time. Again, only one phoenix. The myth is, is that a, a phoenix will live for 500 years. And at the end of those 500 years, will come back to the homeland, to the tree where it all began, where his first home was, build a nest, build a little egg made of myrrh, and sit in that tree. The sun will do its work, and the phoenix will catch on fire and become nothing more than ash. But out of that ash will come the new phoenix, the new phoenix that will be as big and as strong as the previous phoenix, just now new and young and ready to serve the sun, will hollow out that egg of myrrh, put the ashes in it, take it to a temple, and go back to that far away land. The story of resurrection, the story of renewal in the myth happens every 500 years. My friends, wouldn't you like to rebuild your life after a certain amount of time? Wouldn't you like to feel young again and strong again? Wouldn't you like to have a bit of resurrection? Wouldn't you like to be renewed? Rise up from the ashes tonight. Feel God's presence working. Feel God calling you to faith. Be intentional in these 40 days. I may have shared this story once before. Forgive me if I have, but it helps us understand the transformation that can take place over these next 40 days for us. There was a man who opened his newspaper one day and there was a headline that had his name it was his obituary on the front page, and it said, Merchant of Death Dies. Well, it wasn't him, but it was interesting that he could see what was being written about him. And being called the Merchant of Death, well, he wasn't very excited about that, wasn't very happy that that was going to be his legacy in this world. You see, he had built a factory because he had a product. He could put blasting caps on dynamite and make it an easy tool to use in wartime. Before that, it was dangerous and not easy to use, but because of the way that he could pull it all together and use the blasting cap, it was a simple tool for war. Hence, merchant of death. Not being pleased that this would be his legacy. He began from that moment on to change things. He wrote a will out a year before his death that explained how he wanted his fortune to be used. You know him as Alfred Nobel, the person who funds the Nobel Prizes, including the Nobel Prize for Peace. Rise up tonight. Confess. Find assurance. Come and get the mark of the cross. Grow your faith over these next 40 days. Lent begins right here. In the footsteps and in the name of the Christ, let us experience this night and all of Lent. Amen.
please be seated as we gather around the table. If we are to follow Jesus, then we are to come to the table because he came to this table with his disciples. He came at a time when he knew the end was near. His heart was heavy. Tonight, as we make confession, as we seek assurance, our hearts could be heavy. And so we come. We come to the table. When Jesus was at table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. After the meal, he took wine and he blessed it and he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. So as we come to the table, let us so remember the one we call Christ and Savior, the one whom we will seek to imitate over these next 40 days. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today begins a period of self-examination and penance. We need to look at our lives, seeking to remember what we are made of and to let go of the things that get in the way of loving you and others. You have not called us to this table because we are good or deserving. You have set this table before us and invited us here because you love us, even in our unworthiness. As we eat this bread and drink of this cup, we remember your son's sacrifice of giving his life on the cross for us. We pray that your grace may work through our lives in the days ahead so that we may glorify and praise you. Through the Holy Spirit, may we be a blessing to others as we have been blessed and help us to love others as we love ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Come, for all is ready. All are invited. Remember the different ways that you can participate in this communion service. Let us receive the sign of the cross. Let us share this holy communion.
you'll remain seated as we enter into the prayer of confession. That as disciples of Christ, we might start using our hands, feet, time, money, and energy for the good of the poor. Let us pray to the God of mercy. Hear our prayer, O God. That citizens everywhere may realize that care for their neighbor consists of more than the mere giving of money. Let us pray to the God of mercy. For the needy, that they may not have to remain despondent and alone, let us pray to the God of mercy. Hear our prayer, O God. For all of us here, that we may be honest enough to admit that we are selfish about and what we can do to, rem to remedy our lack of love, let us pray to the God of mercy. Hear our prayer, O God. Merciful God, the ashes are our pledge to take up the cross of life. We came through from the earth, and we will go back to it. In the meantime, beginning these 40 days, we will try to live here and make it a better home for everybody. Through Christ our Lord, amen. Hear the good news of God's reconciling love toward all, and believe through Christ God chose to reconcile the whole universe, making peace through Christ's crucifixion upon the cross, to reconcile all things, whether on earth or in heaven, through Christ alone. We will now sing hymn number 527, More Love to Thee, O Christ. Are you ready? Are you ready for this 40-day journey? Rise up, go into the world, show with your actions and your words that you are a follower of the Christ, even to Good Friday.
even to Easter Sunday. In the name of the Christ, amen.